<laughs> this is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Covered in Pet Hair, a boozy web show for pet lovers on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Isabel Alvarez Arada, and today I have the pleasure of having a drink and a chat with the subject matter expert on animal accommodation law. I'll tell you all about her and introduce you as soon as we come back from these messages from our sponsors. Welcome back to Covered in Pet Hair. I'm your host, Isabel Alvarez Arada, and today I have the pleasure of having a drink with a pretty important lady. She is cat ma to Portia. She is an animal aficionado and a rescue foster. She's a wine snob, but she loves coffee and tea. She's a world traveler, an adventure seeker. She's a fan of alpacas and horses, founder of Opening Doors, animal accommodation subject matter expert, public policy specialist, Abby Volen. Welcome, Abby. You are quite the lady to be speaking to these days. Well, thank you very much for having me. I've been looking forward to joining you on the show. Oh my goodness, it's so exciting. I'm a little intimidated because this is a really heavy topic and one that affects so many people in so many ways. And there's, it's so nuanced that I wanna make sure that in this tiny little show with our little glasses of wine, we kind of get it right. So (laughs) thank you for uh, working with me as I navigate this really important topic. Absolutely. I mean, knowledge is power. And so really untangling all the myths and bad information is is really important. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what I always hope to do on this show. So before we go any further, anybody Mm -hmm. participating in our drinking game, every time you hear this word, make sure you take a drink. But remember, there's an attorney present. So be (laughs) over 21 before you take that drink. Never drink and drive and always drink responsibly. And if you're watching outside the US, whatever the legal drinking age is, that's all you need to be. All right. So what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking first, I have to say, um, one of my friends got this for me. It is a, uh, what is it, quarantine survival glass. We all got one with our names on them. And it is true. It really, truly has been my buddy. Um, (laughs) I am drinking a limonello, which is lemoncello and sparkling wine and my favorite, vodka. (gasps) That sounds amazing. I definitely want the recipe for that because I do (laughs) share the recipes with our, uh, with our listeners and with our viewers on YouTube and on social media. So I will share that with anybody who's a limoncello fan because I know I am too. (laughs) So we're all in it. We're in Europe this tonight because I'm having a Portuguese red blend. Oh, yeah. I'm into the Portuguese wines these days. So cheers Cheers. to uh, being on the show. Absolutely. I was in Portugal oh, really? and we had all, we took all these tours of a port of all oh. the, all these places that, that, um, that have port and make port and was outstanding. Oh my gosh. So I don't know. You're in the DC area, right? Mm-hmm. I'm in El Paso and Costco has this Portuguese red blend right now. That is $7 and 50 cents and it's 90 points on wide spectator. And it's, so good but my really? mom's in florida and she can't get it there so just keep an eye out it, so if you, you go, need if you to costco stock up is what it sounds like i know i know i know it's gonna it's gonna it's it was here for a while and then i moved it downstairs so i can have it um more regularly so yeah um so you have to have some kind of background in animals before law because you've dedicated your whole life to animals and law and like melding these two passions of yours. So what is your background? How did you end up founding Opening Doors? I would say I am extraordinarily lucky. And it's, it, you say I devoted my whole life to it. Um, I started it about three or four years ago. And it really is the culmination of all my education and all my work experience and all of my passion just kind of combined into one thing. Uh, So I am 
incredibly fortunate, incredibly. I've been obsessed with horses since I was seven years old. Actually, I was obsessed before I was seven years old, but it took me till seven for me to say, mom, can I please take some horseback riding lessons? Um, you know, so, so I have just, I've always, always been an animal person. And, um, it's funny when I, when I was working as an attorney in, in New York, uh, I, I discovered this world of shelter and rescue and working with them. And then of course that, you know, I say, I, I worked on that stuff in my, in my free time, which very quickly, very quickly becomes, uh, your whole life, right? Because it's just, it's, it's so important to you and fulfilling and, and just it really hits all those passion points. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to get a wonderful job at um, Humane Society of the United States where I was creating programs for rescue groups. Um, and I worked on policy initiatives, mostly on um, housing and breed issues. Awesome. Well, I wanna play a game with you before we delve into all of the details, because again, this is a big topic to unpack. And I want our listeners and our viewers to kind of get an idea of what the words we're going to be using a lot of mean. So we're okay. going to play a game because I believe that playing games and learning go perfectly hand in hand. So this is called definitions defined. Redundant, yes, but fun. And I'm going to give you a word and you're going to define it, but quickly. You're going to okay. tell me in maybe one sentence what the definition means. I recognize that I'm asking you to simplify a very complex topic, Oh, but here we I go. I forward to the challenge. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> so definitions defined. Impairment. A physical or mental difficulty that impacts impacts your daily living activities. Beautiful. All right. Next one, assistance animal. This is an animal that essentially helps you manage an impairment you have in your life. Beautiful. Look at you. You're acing this. All right. Next one, service animal. This is a dog or miniature horse that is trained to help you manage your impairment. Fantastic. Disability. Disability, it, it, it's similar to impairment. So it's a physical or mental impairment that um, hampers an activity of your daily living. So how is it different from impairment? Not, I mean, impairment, they say like, a, a, by, by legal definition, they say like a physical or mental impairment. So an impairment would, would be, uh, impairment is, you know. The condition. The, the condition, yes. Got yes. it. Okay, perfect. So they're synonymous. In yeah, let's say there's, they are. They really are. Wonderful. Okay, we've got two more. Okay. Accommodation. So it's a reasonable accommodation, meaning it has to be reasonable. Um, it's an exception to a policy so that people living with disabilities can, you know, uh, enjoy and use um, their dwelling or their surroundings just as everyone else. Wonderful. And the last one, regulation. A law or policy in place, um, theoretically to solve some problem. Wonderful. Okay. Those, you see, you did a great job because we kind of get overwhelmed by these words and we don't know what they mean, but that was perfectly succinct. So thank you so much. I will delve more into the difference between service animal and assistance animal as we progress, but you work in animal accommodation law. Is that a term you coined? Because I did some research on it and I really only find it in relation to you. <laughs> yes. I mean, this, this falls under the rubric. It actually falls under civil rights laws and it falls under disability rights law, right? So, you know, I say, I say animal accommodation law because I specifically focus on the animal aspect, but it's disability rights. Um, so whether or not this is about needing a grab bar or an assistance animal, it, you know, this is about disability rights. It's about helping people with disabilities use and enjoy their surroundings the same as everyone else. But yes, I coined the term animal accommodation law because that specific animal aspect is my focus. That's so cool. I'm already fangirling over here. I think it's so cool. I'm impressed. So how, so I understand how you got to your love of 
pets and how you ended up bringing pets into your law career, but why, dis- why, why disability law? What, what brought you to that? One out of four people are living with a disability currently, and it's about 46, 47% of people will, in- will experience a mental health condition in their lifetime. Um, disability under the Fair Housing Act, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, under, under these disability rights laws has a very broad meaning. It essentially means that it's more difficult for you to perform daily life activities like, you know, get, getting up and taking care of yourself, standing, sitting, concentrating, it makes it more difficult for you to perform these tasks than it does for the average person. What a low bar, right? (laughs) So it really, it does impact so many people. You know, people will say, oh, well, isn't every pet an emotional support animal? Perhaps, but we can get into that later, but not everybody is living with a disability under these rules under under these disability rights laws um and and you know i'm someone who has struggled with a lot in my life um i will tell you i mean i've always struggled with depression and anxiety and my god as a child in particular i don't i don't know how i would have managed if it weren't for my dog and for all the horses and ponies i mean those those were my saviors I think the word disability has a negative connotation, right? Unfortunately, and, um, unfortunately. Yeah, nobody yeah. wants to call themselves that, right? Yeah. Right, nobody wants to call themselves disabled. Nobody wants to admit they have limitations. Right. But the fact is you have to take care of yourself. And I mean, we, I think we knew this intuitively for years, but research is starting to catch up with the fact that animals help heal us in limitless ways. So as a child and even as an adult, I mean, my, my pets have been there for me through thick and thin um, as, as I've struggled with, with the depression and anxiety. Um, I went through treatment for breast cancer um, a little over six years ago. I had a day nurse and a night nurse and my day nurse would keep her eyes on me all day and hang around my neck my night nurse would sleep on top of my head every single night. And people would say, oh, that's because your head was emitting heat. I said, no, she knew, she knew. Cause guess what? She doesn't sleep by my head anymore. They know. They do. And it's such a good, I guess, melding of their talents because they live to serve and they want to, to be with their person and they want to protect the person and the person who may doesn't maybe doesn't want to ask another human for help can count on the furry f- member of the family for that support. And I think sometimes people don't know what to ask for. Truth. Absolute I never, truth. I never would have thought, oh, I need my cat to sleep on top of my head since I don't have any hair and it's winter time. Um, so ugh, animals have just had such a critical and impactful meaning um, and presence in my life. And the more I dug into these animal accommodation laws, the more I realized that they can help just an increasingly large number of people. So let's get rid of those misconceptions, which I once held as well. Um, and let's get the information out to people so that they know here's another tool that you have. And guess what? It's right next to you. That is amazing. And do you usually represent the individuals, the families with the pets or the corporations, housing providers, or both? Both. I like to play on both sides. So individuals will come to me um, when they're when they're having trouble with their landlord and they're trying to assert a reasonable accommodation for an assistance animal, and the housing provider, whether it be a rental or a HOA, frankly, it's usually an HOA because rentals are a lot more risk adverse about this. Um, they, you know, the, the HOA is being obnoxious about it, and uh, so they they come to me for help. And, and this is why we have lawyers, because of course, 
people are so emotional as, as am I, when it comes to anything that may, may harm or risk our pets. Right. And then I get these cases that I'm like, Oh, this one's going to be fun. I can't wait to write this letter. Um, <laughs> You know, and it's also not so surprising that the second you, uh, you know, a board or housing provider receives a letter from someone with an ESQ next to their name, uh, their response is quite different. So I work with, I, I, I love working with individuals, um, individual pet owners, but then I also work with a lot of housing providers because they want to know um, what, what are my rights and responsibilities. What can I do to, avo to avoid a fair housing violation? Um, outgoing or former secretary um, of, of HUD, Ben Carson, actually said just a couple of weeks ago that the majority of um, discrimination cases that, that they dealt with during his tenure were for disability. And the majority of disability discrimination cases they dealt with were about animals. Wow. So, and, and even during the pandemic, HUD has not slowed down in enforcing starting actions against housing providers who are discriminating against people with service and assistance animals. And so a housing provider will come to me and say, look, I, I want to make sure I'm doing everything right. And they will say, I don't want pets on my property. I don't want any pets on my property, but I know I have to do this. And so I work with them, right? Like I say, okay, I understand where you're coming from and, and I will help them craft policies um, so, so that they only have to allow the animals that they are required to by law. And I will help them tailor these policies um, because frankly, my philosophy is that if you have the right policies, um, even if you do not want pets, but you know you have to have these animals, um, so even I'll help you craft policies um, to make everyone accountable and responsible for their animal. And certainly my hope is that once they see it's not a big deal to have animals, they might start thinking differently down the road. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. I like that idea. You kind of give them baby steps to acceptance yeah. of these animals that are kind of required by law, but they don't really like it, huh? And, and so once I explain to housing providers that they have rights and I want them to enforce their rights, I think that goes a long way to, to gaining their trust along the way too. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. So I want to take a break and go to our commercial break, but I want to come back and talk about how you impact, how you work with airlines on travel and animal accommodation in our airplanes. So we'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Welcome back to Covered in Pet Hair. I'm your host, Isabel Alvarez Arada. And today I am talking to an expert in animal accommodation law. And she's going to tell us a little bit more about kind of her feeling on a little thing here or there. So I, 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 yeah, I, I listened to some um, interviews that you did. And the one thing that kind of kept popping up is that you don't like the term emotional support dog or support animal, emotional support animal. Why is that? I hate that term. <laughs> okay. You hate that term. <laughs> I hate it. I'm going to say it. I hate that term. Okay. Several reasons. Um, one is that it's become a punchline. And, you know, it's funny. I actually saw um, a Family Guy episode where the dog was wearing an emotional support animal vest. And I'm like, man, it, it, we have sunk so low that Family Guy is now mocking it. Um, it's become a punchline. It has become, oh, this poor special snowflake can't get by without their emotional support animal. Um, I don't know what emotional support animal means. We don't call it emotional support doctors. We don't call it emotional support medication. So what, if we have a health aid, what is this emotional support animal? And actually what's so interesting to me is that this was never a term found in any of the regulations or the statutes. Where'd it come from? 
what the statutes and the regulations and guidelines say is, you know, it's a, it assists the animal, it's any animal that, that works or performs a task that alleviates a symptom or effect of an individual's disability or an animal that provides emotional support. Got it. So somebody just like switched it up and called it an emotional support dog. So, and it took off. I mean, that's what, I mean, from my understanding before preparing for this show, from my understanding, there was a service animal that I didn't know was only allowed to be a dog or a small horse. I didn't know. I just thought a, a service animal was just trained and had some kind of like education that qualified it as such. And then I thought there was emotional support animal. I didn't realize there was an assistant assistance animal, which is what really we should be calling any animal that provides support that isn't considered a service dog or a service animal. So one, it's stigmatizing, right? We're further stigmatizing mental health, which I think particularly COVID is highlighting. Man. That it's, yeah, that it's so rampant right now. Nobody is immune to, to anxiety and to depression. And we're seeing it across so many age groups. It's, I guess it's giving us a rude awakening to how easy it is. Absolutely. And we're still so isolated. People need an outlet. Mental health is a really important issue. And it's something that, as I said, you know, uh, 47% of of adults will will experience a mental health condition at some point in their lives. Wow. It's, It's nothing to stigmatize. So, all right. So I was giving the example of my day nurse and my night nurse as I was dealing with cancer. Well, that's not necessarily emotional support, whatever it is that means, right? Um, they were helping me through cancer. Yeah. And so the, and my point to this is that the list of impairments for which animals help us is not limited to mental health. It is limitless. And the more, you know, I think intuitive, intuitively we always knew this, but the more we or doing studies and learn about this, the more research there is establishing that animals help us just for so many different impairments. So assistance animal is any animal that provides any kind of assistance, whether it be emotional, physical, mental, can um, smell a change in blood sugar, can recognize uh, signs of a seizure, but isn't a trained service animal. Not yes, exactly. So assistance animals are only allowed in housing pursuant to the Fair Housing Act. Um, Service animals are allowed in public places under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And what people don't understand, a lot of people don't understand is that assistance animals are not allowed in those public spaces. So assistance animals includes service animals. I like to think of it as, this, this shows me it's kind of the math nerd I used to be. Every square is a rectangle, but not every rectangle is a square, right? Right. So every service animal is also an assistance animal, but not every assistance animal is a service animal. And service animals are the ones that wear the little harness. It says I'm a service animal, but people get sneaky and they go buy something that kind of looks the same and they call it a service animal. And then the person who's running the show, whether it be a restaurant or a housing development or an airline, they're kind of stuck having to educate all their people on what really is a service animal and what isn't and what, what this little red harness that says I'm working really doesn't mean anything. Legally, those, those vests, those certifications, those registrations, those ID cards, it says, you know, official service animal are legally meaningless. Legally is there any meaningful. certification that's meaningful? Um, for purposes of establishing that you need a reasonable accommodation, no. Okay. No, none of them are necessary. Anyone who tells you otherwise is just trying to sell you something. The reason I got even connected with you is because we have a mutual friend and I posted on my Facebook page when the news of the air carrier access act having changed 
I posted on my Facebook page saying, does anybody have, do I know any experts in this? Cause I want to have an intelligent conversation about what this actually means. And we got put in touch by Heather. Thank you, Heather, because I needed to talk to somebody to, to, to like, to just make it clear what the airlines had going on before what it looks like now. And I don't know that anything has passed yet, but this is something that's coming. So no, it's can you, done. it's a done deal. Oh, it's already done. Okay. So what did it look like before? And then what are the changes that were made with the airlines? We're talking about the air carrier access act. Um, and that's because the Americans with disabilities act specifically has in its regulations, it says, and these do not apply to airlines. These do not apply to air carriers. So anything that's allowed for disability rights under the American with Disabilities Act does not apply at all for air carriers. So under the Air Carrier Access Act, they, they, it's, it's, a, it's a different disability rights law that has nothing to do with the ADA or the Fair Housing Act. The ACAA, the uh, Air Carrier Access Act, mm -hmm. what did it get more strict or did it get less strict? Because what we were reading, and th this is me, just general public, um, was that it got more strict. Well, under the Air Carrier Access Act, previously, the regulations allowed service animals and emotional support animals a reasonable accommodation um, to to be in the cabin if needed. So yeah. a lot of people, me included until I took this on and researched uh, mostly the interviews that you've done in the past, most of us thought that people were just taking advantage left and right of this like emotional support dog on an airplane. Everybody has an emotional support dog. And I thought that it was because people just didn't want to pay because the airlines allow pets assuming they have the right they're the right size airlines allow pets in the cabin they have to be able to go in the carrier and under the seat in front of you and all that but they usually charge a lot of money so from my understanding people were just saying that they had an emotional support dog so they didn't have to pay the 150 dollars each way for their dog has the cha have the changes made to the air carrier access act changed that like the money involved and the the motivation there we haven't even talked about what the changes are so i will get to that yeah but what the airlines and what housing providers don't quite i, I don't know if they don't grasp it or if they won't acknowledge it or admit to it they have a role they absolutely have a role in the proliferation of animal accommodation requests because of their policy and, and a reasonable accommodation, as we said at the very beginning, it's, a, it's an exception to the policy. If the policy weren't there, you wouldn't need an exception to it. Okay, so we are now being charged for uh, the for being able to choose our seats ahead mm -hmm. of time. Mm -hmm. Forget like the peanuts and the snacks and you used to get a free drink, you don't get that anymore. Now you can't even change, choose your seat ahead of time without paying. Yep. We are being nickeled and dimed, right? Yes. And it doesn't feel good. Tickets are expensive to begin with. So you're gonna say all this and then you're gonna charge another $150 per leg Per, per flight for an animal, I don't blame people for making the exception, for wanting an exception. I simply, I don't blame them. And the airlines do have a role in this. And I wish they would take more responsibility for owning up to it. You know, I'm not saying they shouldn't charge any fees, but perhaps they should charge fewer fees. Um, their policies before you would have an emotional support animal and a, and a service animal in the cabin. Well, an assistance animal does not need to be a horse, a miniature horse or a dog, an assistance animal previously. And actually this has changed a little bit too, but there really were no restrictions on what an assistance animal could be other than it had to be reasonable, meaning it didn't pose a direct threat to the health and safety of others. 
Yeah, I heard you say something about like a boa constrictor would not be reasonable on an airplane. I well, I don't think a, a boa constrictor is reasonable in a housing context. Either, exactly, exactly. And I have had people come up to me and say, "Here's a request for a boa constrictor," and I say, "Absolutely, deny that," and they don't. What? That's crazy. Yes, that's crazy. Oh my goodness. That's crazy, right? Like <laughs> that's not. It's just not reasonable. That poses a direct threat to the health and safety of others. Anyway, you're allowed to have service animals and, and emotion, only emotional support animals, not other types of assistance animals. And, and previously, they could be any animal. So that's when you had the absurd stories of, you know, peacocks and, and llamas and whatnot. And um, so the, you know, the reason, one of the reasons that you're allowed to have these reasonable accommodations on airplanes is even if you don't need the animal during the flight, if you need the animal during the destination, it's really important that you have the animal with you there at the destination. Can't, you can't ship it by UPS. So yeah. <laughs> nor should you, if that's it. Nor, nor should you. Um, so, and, and under the Fair Housing Act, even if you're a guest, you're allowed to that reasonable accommodation, right? So you can have that animal with you at your at your destination. Um, so people, there really were no rules. The DOT really didn't provide guidance um, as to what any parameters were for for emotional support animals. So. So sometimes you would have these crazy animals that were untethered and unrestrained in the cabin. I mean, that's just complete lunacy. And I mean, the fact that it ta it's, ha it's taken this long till February of 2021 to address that is insanity. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I thought the airlines that I thought their I thought their policies under you know, the DOT sets regulations. But then the airlines craft their own policies. And certainly, you know, the, the federal law, it serves as a floor, not a ceiling, meaning that this is the minimum standard which you must adhere to. But if you want to, if you want to give people um, more protection, people living with disabilities, more protections under your own policies, you are welcome to do so. Same with state law. So a lot of airline policy, uh, a lot of airlines were, they were, they were, they were too afraid of, of, uh, of making policies that really kind of made more common sense. And you know, the DOT never said, well, you have to let this animal on the, in the cabin unrestrained, but people were doing that anyway. If I'm flying with my cat, she absolutely does not need to be on my lap during the flight, nor should she be, frankly, Correct. unless she, and I feel the same about service animals. Even a dog that's a service animal, it should be, if not trained to, to, to fly, um, it should at least be, you know, you should have reasonable comfort that the animal will not freak out and cause a huge problem while right. flying. Absolutely. And I think that's reasonable. We're talking about the health and safety of everyone on board, which is yes. important. Of course. Um, yeah. So previously, you could have uh, emotional support animals on untethered, unrestrained, um, and you could have service animals, miniature horse or dog, unrestrained. Um, the and you could you could use those uh, certificates or ID, or ID cards to say, yeah, this is this is a, a, an emotional support animal. Um, and the new rules are, they are much better. They're, but they're a little bit problematic because of something I mentioned earlier. So now you're only allowed to service animals on the flight. They are the only ones being granted a reasonable accommodation. So they are the only ones allowed in a cabin. And I believe they are limited to dogs. So no more miniature horses on planes. By the way, the reason people will have miniature horses as opposed to dogs is because they live longer. Oh, interesting. And like, think about it. If you need... Um, let's say I have a seizure disorder, which I do. Um, uh, if, if I need someone to hold me steady, a horse is going to be better equipped to do that than a dog. Smart. And, okay. And a miniature horse will live 30 years as a dog will live, you know, 10 to 12, 15 at most. Makes sense. Um, 
right? Makes sense. So you're only allowed to have service animals, dogs on airplanes, and there are no more accommodations for emotional support animals or other kinds of assistance animals. And I, I think the first part makes a lot sense, makes a lot of sense, only allowing service animals on board. And you do have to assign an attestation saying my, my dog can behave on a flight. Although frankly, I think we need to be really careful about this because I mean, people are bad, people, it, flying makes a lot of people anxious, right? Um, so just imagine if you're a dog and you're not verbal and I can't tell you what's going on, right? Like, no, it's terrifying. That, it's that much more stressful um, for an animal to be flying on a plane. So if you have a service animal, you still have to sign an attestation that says, eh, my dog will be fine. My dog will be well behaved on this flight. Right. Um, I'm, I, I, I fear that the DOT threw out the baby with the bathwater. And I wrote, um, I, I, with a colleague of mine, um, Vivian Levin, who is a, a dog behaviorist and trainer, um, she and I submitted comments saying, yeah, you know, we, we, I think you need to make sure or have someone attest to the fact that their service dog will be okay on a plane. But it's also really important to allow um, all assistance animals. You need to you need to um, uh, you need to make the definition of of serve, of assistance animal that to correlate with that of the Fair Housing Act, right? So, like, let's get rid of the confusion. Let's let's define it the same. Um, and then you do need you still do need to accommodate them. So whether so so that should be in terms of a um you, you don't charge them you, you don't charge people who have an assistance animal and it's interesting i mean i submitted uh i submitted comments and and in their regulations um in their new rule they actually cited me <laughs> which oh good flattered. i was actually going to ask you if you've consulted with them with the so, dot so or they, with the airlines. Yeah, they cited my comments and then they promptly told me why they were ignoring them. And, and I said, you need to align the definition um, of assistance animal with that of the Fair Housing Act. And they, you know, and then allow and then and then provide accommodations for assistance animals. And their response was, eh, that's too difficult. We don't want to have two different standards when in reality, you already have that, right? It would be the one. It would if it would be easier if you lined it all up. Right. Uh, so they already discounted that. They said, nope, we're not, we're not gonna make that exception. So I think they went a little too far in that. And that's the problem. So, so what the regulation is right now, and I have yet, and airlines now with these new regulations in place are crafting their policies. And I have yet to find a policy that provides um, more protections for individuals living with disabilities. They are hewing uh, exactly to what the Department of Transportation is saying, you know, here's the minimum standard that you must adhere to. So what we're seeing is that only service animals are allowed in the cabin on flights, only dogs, not miniature horses, and they have to sign an attestation form um, saying, you know, hey, I'm help this dog is healthy, this dog is updated on rabies and vaccinations and all of that. And oh yeah, this dog will also behave on this flight. But that's the only accommodation they make. So for those people that have a, um, a service animal that's too large, that they can't accommodate for whatever reason, or an assistance animal that has to go in cargo. One of your interviews, you said that there, the casualties of dogs traveling in cargo are really, really low. Most of us are terrified to put our dogs in cargo. But that's not based on reality. That's not evidence-based fear. Frankly, the number of, of pets that die on planes throughout a year, I mean, you can count them on one or two hands. But my God, you don't want to be that one. Exactly. It's terrifying. So I get it. I agree with, like, I get it. You do not want to be that one. The risks are very low. And talk to your vet, you know, look at the AVMA guidelines, talk to your veterinarians about 
ways you can mitigate risks while flying with your pets, right? Even right. if they're in cargo. Okay. It's still scary. I, it's I terrifying. It. It's terrifying. There's it, there's a lot of misconception and misunderstanding that surrounds this topic. It's the fact that my pet is not safe in cargo, so I have to get them in the cabin. And then now I don't know what even to call my pet because I don't know what they're going to allow, what they're not going to allow. When it comes to service animals, and again, this is something people don't realize, it doesn't have to be trained by a professional. It does not have to be trained by you know, someone who charges thousands upon thousands of dollars for training. You can train your own service animal, which is so important because it makes it accessible to people regardless of their income level. Now, there are certainly some tasks that may require the use of a professional trainer who costs thousands upon thousands of dollars, but it need not be. Let's say that one of my immediate family members has a need for a service animal and I decide to train them myself. How do I get them recognized as a service animal? So if you, so service animals are allowed in dwellings, they're allowed in um, public spaces, they're allowed in your place of employment uh, and they're allowed on, on aircraft. And um, I'm gonna leave behind the Air Carrier Access Act, but essentially, well, even under there, um, for to verify that you are eligible for a service animal, you can be asked two questions. Do you need this animal because of a disability? What task is the animal trained to perform? You don't have to tell them what your disability is. You don't have to prove it. And they can't say, you say this dog can dance. Let's see him dance. They can't <laughs> say that. They can't make you do that, right? So. And, and so anything that says like, well, it's certifying, there's nothing that's certifying. Th that being said, there, there are certain, you know, like guide dogs for the blind. They could have a certification standard saying this dog was trained to, you know, and that's totally different. It just legally makes absolutely no difference. So I can show up to the counter with a dog that is helping, let's say my child who has a neurological condition. And I can say, they'll ask me, is this dog a required service animal? I will say, yes, it's my child's service animal. What is the dog doing? It's looking for signs of something changing in my child's neurological ADHD. condition. Let's say ADHD. Okay. Right? But then I'm giving, but if I say ADHD, then I'm giving the diagnosis. So how would I say it without giving the diagnosis? Um, that when my son starts to uh, get panicked, the dog will come over and calm him down. Now, perfect. stop. Uh, no, that is not correct. You have to submit this attestation form right. before the flight. Okay. So, so, so it has, uh, the attestation form is before you have to call the airline, let them know a service animal's coming. You no, fill out the attestation you form have to prior. Call them. You just have to fill it out and submit it to them. Okay. So is, is it on an online form? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. Well, that's easy. And then they, they just verify that once you arrive to check in. Yes. I mean, ideally you do it beforehand. Um, and there are exceptions. If you book your flight, uh, you know, less than 48 hours before the flight, well then, you know, you, then you don't have to, um, then, then there is the exception and the airline doesn't have to approve it ahead of time. You can just come to the gate. Got it. Um, so, so, and, and this is frankly, this is hard on airlines as well. I mean, it's, it simplifies things, but it creates so many more hours of work for, for their staff. So it's still really difficult. Do you think that they're going to take any steps back? Kind of meet somewhere between the previous law and what they've currently declared? The airlines are going to absolutely not, not unless they're forced to. Well, the DOT, I guess, with the DOT. Oh gosh, I mean, so when it comes to regulations, it takes a long time to get a regulation through and passed and finalized. This is not easy. I don't see them changing this anytime soon. Oh my goodness. Okay, well, I have to wrap this up. Again, I'm so grateful for all of this wealth of knowledge that you've shared with us. How can our listeners and viewers get in touch with you if they find themselves in a position where they need your representation? 
go to my website. It's pauseopeningdoors.com or email me at avoglin at pauseopeningdoors.com or info at pauseopeningdoors.com and um, you can find me. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I want to propose a toast to you and for all that you're doing to bridge the needs of so many. <laughs> Truly. <As to> you. <laughs> Cheers. Live. And to our uh, executive producer, Mark Winter, here's to you for making this show possible and to our viewers and listeners. Um, thank you for taking the time to share with us. And here's to a life covered in pet hair because there's no better way to live. Lachaim? <laughs> Lachaim, to life. <laughs> <laughs> to life. <laughs> Cheers. To learn more about covered in pet hair, visit coveredinpethair.com or petliferadio.com. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.